Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly, episode 400. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks for tuning in today. We've got an all day, well, from 10 to 6, I guess technically that's all day, podcast. In support of the EFF, um, you can go to uh, wiki.securityweekly.com, click on episode 400 and get the schedule for today. It being just about 1 o'clock, we have Jeremy and Richard from the EFF here with us today. Um, so, uh, Jeremy, I'll start with you if you could introduce yourself uh, and, and explain your role at the EFF. Sure thing. So, I'm uh, Jeremy Galula. I'm a staff technologist here at EFF. Uh, so, that means that I, you want the, the full bio or the Sure, the, the full bio. We wanna, my goal <laughs> for this segment, uh, Jeremy and Richard, is to learn more about the EFF and let our listeners learn more about the EFF. So, it'll be, it'll be super easy, I promise. <laughs> sure thing. So, so my role at EFF as a as a technologist uh, is basically if the lawyers, the attorneys, have technology questions, like you know they're in a case and they're like you know how does this technology work? I figure that out if I don't already know. Uh, I also uh, we answer if there are press questions on technology issues. Uh, technologists handle those too. Uh, but the big thing that technologists do is we help develop tools like HTTPS Everywhere, Privacy Badger. Uh, in the past, we've done things like uh, Panopticlick. So these are these are uh, privacy-enhancing tools uh, developed at EFF uh, that you can use in your browser uh, to you know secure your connections or block uh, third-party tracking. And I can talk more about those later if we want. Awesome. But yeah, that'd be great. I'll, uh, I'll let Richard maybe talk a little bit too. Sure. Hi, Richard. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Happy to be here. So uh, uh, Richard, yeah, go ahead. Explain your your role at the EFF. Sure, uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, so I'm Richard Esquera. I'm the uh, development director at EFF. Uh, that's development, like uh, nonprofit fundraising development. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been at this for about two years. It means that I get to meet a lot of people uh, in the community, the uh, big community of people supporting EFF. Um, security researchers make up a big portion of, I think, uh, the core of people who like really understand what EFF issues are about. They understand uh, free speech, privacy, security. They, they understand sort of the interplay of all these things. Uh, with digital technology, so um, we we count a lot of security uh, computer security people in in the ranks. Um, and before doing the fundraising stuff, uh, I was a I was an activist on staff for uh, for about four years. Mm -hmm. um, so at that time, I was working on uh, blog posts and running action campaigns on stuff that was bad. Um, at the time, the big fight we were having was uh, in Congress over uh, telecom immunity. Um, we had a couple of uh, legal cases against, uh, well, the, the main one was against AT&T uh, for allowing the NSA to come in and spy on people. Um, so it was a case against AT&T, and uh, we were actually doing pretty well. We were getting past all the legal procedural hurdles. And what ended up happening is they went to Congress and said, hey, we need an immunity law. So we had to sort of shift our fight and go to Congress and say the immunity law would be bad. It would be, it would be an injustice for this to happen. And, and so we were having that fight uh, at the time. Um, that was that was a, a few years ago now, and and uh, we're kind of in a new era of uh, fighting over these issues, mm -hmm. as you might imagine after after last year. So I think m many of our listeners they know of the EFF. They think it's great to support the EFF for probably a, a wide variety of uh, issues that they feel are important to them or important to others that are close to them. But uh, I guess for you know our listeners, help us understand what what is the EFF's uh, mission. Sure. Well, the, I would say that the core, the, the way to describe the banner, the core mission is to protect the rights and freedoms of internet users, or of uh, rather technology users. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the internet is such an important uh, sort of sort of consuming part of it, but really, it goes it goes beyond that. Um, it's really just about digital technology um, on, uh, as a as a tool, as a as a as a uh, advances in society things that we're we're using. Um, I guess uh, one real uh, good thing to point out is the founding case um, that EFF got involved in, which was um, the uh, United States Secret Service took a bunch of computers from uh, Steve Jackson Games. Um, so they're uh, they're like a producer of um, of like tabletop games. They make a game called Munchkin. They made a game called Illuminati. Um, I don't know if any of these things are kind of familiar to to the audience, but anyway. Certainly to me they are, so, uh, yeah. Yes, excellent. <laughs> yep. Steve Jackson's game is excellent. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a big tabletop gamer, so that's sort of like my hobby when I'm not, uh, when I'm not here at EFF cracking the whip. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so, uh, so the, that founding case, you know, the Secret Service went in and they took a bunch of, of computers for this RPG company because 
uh, the RPG company was making a, uh, a, a tabletop game uh, about cyberpunk. And so uh, they were making a game. There was, like, uh, hacking stuff in the cyberpunk RPG where obviously it's, like, you know, you roll to hack the Gibson. And then, you know, you, uh, that's, that's sort of what, the, uh, what, the, what they were working on. And so the Secret Service thought this was about real hacking and so took a bunch of computers and at that time, there wasn't really um, the rules around whether or not the government could do this kind of thing weren't really established. So um, the co-founders of the EFF set up a fund, and then they, they paid for lawyers to defend this case, or rather to sue the Secret Service to try and get all that stuff back, get damages, and kind of affirm that, uh, that you know, you need, cops, you need a warrant to come and, and take computers because they carry important, important personal effects and they're protected by the Fourth, the fourth Amendment. Um, so that was the first founding case, and so ever since then, it's been a string of things about protecting the rights of technology users um, in, in lots of different ways. A lot of times, it's about privacy. Uh, the Constitution obviously plays a big part in this, and those are sort of the core guiding principles. Um, it means that most of the staff of the EFF is lawyers, so about half of us are lawyers, and then about the other half are technologists and activists mm -hmm. who uh, kind of work on different angles of the problem, right? Because at a certain point, you know, technology and, and the internet and everything became big enough that it wasn't just about, you couldn't just fight these things with law. Sometimes you have to know a lot about the technology. Sometimes you have to uh, make technology itself to drive it forward. And sometimes you just need to convince the public of something, of something uh, that something is important. And so that's sort of where the activism team comes in. So it's really all those pieces now kind of working together, uh, again, to protect uh, technology users' rights. Um, with respects to the Fourth Amendment, you know, where, where do we stand where that intersects with technology? I know that was a hot topic several years ago, uh, or a few years ago even. Is that still some you know, ongoing cases with that? Yeah, there, there definitely are. And uh, Jeremy, feel free to jump in if, uh, if, I'm, if I'm kind of running here. I like to talk, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was going to say, we've, we've made some good progress. Uh, there was a, a case the Supreme Court decided this past uh, June or July uh, for example, that said, uh, police need a warrant to search your cell phone, even if they, you know, seize it from you when, when you're arrested and, you know, they, they saw you commit a crime, they still need to go get that warrant uh, to, to search your cell phone. And that was a big thing, you know, prior to that Supreme Court ruling, there was sort of a mishmash of, you know, depending on which circuit you were in or which state you were in, it wasn't clear. Uh, so we made progress there. Um, what else? Uh, one, some ongoing cases that are being fought have to do with uh, collecting location data from uh, cell phone services. So going to your, your, you know, your cell phone company, uh, the law enforcement, and trying to you know, say, we want the tower dump of all the cell phones that connected to this, this tower because we want to know if someone was there. Uh, and we're fighting some cases saying the police need a warrant for that, too. They can't just you know, use a subpoena or the, uh, the companies can't just decide to turn it over. Uh, and there's, uh, and of course, there are others. I'll let Richard sort of jump in. Well, yeah, I mean, the other big category of Fourth Amendment cases we're working on are about, um, are about the NSA. It's, it's whether or not the NSA can, can under different authorities and under a weird mishmash of um, kind of uh, twisted D.C. government language, can they uh, uh, collect all of the communications that they can and can they search through them and catalog them and tag them? Um, create records of, of metadata and then and then use those um, for surveillance. Um, th so those, that that I think is the other big category of Fourth Amendment stuff um, that that's in process right now. As a matter of fact, actually, there's a, a hearing going on in one of our cases at this very moment. Unless it's over, uh, I doubt it's over yet. In uh, our Jewel v. NSA case, uh, which is one that we brought, uh, Richard can correct me if I'm wrong. Again, I'm a technologist. I don't. The, the lawyers know a whole lot more about this stuff than I do, but uh, that was one we brought even before the Snowden leaks. Uh, where yeah, that one was started in, uh, in 2008. It was um, from a, pr most of the, the evidence in that case is from a prior whistleblower's um, report. It was an AT&T technician. His name is Mark Klein. Uh, the, he was sort of tasked with wiring up uh, uh, the room that, that you needed an NSA clearance to get into that room. Um, he had the the equipment lists and a lot of, of a lot of interesting evidence that he brought to EFF. Um, we were able to sort of take it to our other te community of technical experts. Our technologists looked at it, and uh, you know, I guess the interesting sort of uh, the smoking gun in those documents, uh, as it were, was a uh, was a piece of hardware used for real time uh, real time live like data and voice analysis. So 
Um, so it, re it seemed really apparent that what was going on in there was probably, uh, was probably surveillance related and it was bulk, it was, it was everything. Um, so he, he blew the whistle, he brought those documents in and so uh, we filed that case in 2008. Um, kind of uh, not knowing that that was just the tip of the iceberg, you know, in terms of what, what the NSA was, was doing uh, in terms of surveilling communications. Yeah. Now, Jeremy, with uh, your role being in technology, what are some yep. of your greatest concerns where technology and privacy intersect? Uh, so one big one, uh, and I think it's something we're going to see more uh, in the, the coming months as HTTP2 starts to roll out. Uh, a lot of the carriers, uh, ISPs, uh, and particularly uh, mobile uh, carriers, have been pushing for something called uh, uh, trusted uh Encrypted, or uh, sorry, what's the word? Uh, trusted proxies, basically. So the, the idea is that HTTP2 originally, uh, for readers who aren't familiar, it's, it's meant to replace HTTP, and it was meant to be uh, encrypted by default. And so we were going to move from a web where the vast majority of traffic, or, or a strong majority, was unencrypted and could be surveilled by the sort of bulk collection that Richard was talking about. To, a, to an era where communications were encrypted by default and it would make bulk collection, bulk dragnets uh, impossible effectively. Uh, but the mobile carriers got you know, their, their knickers in a twist uh, because they were concerned that, wait, we're not going to be able to sniff on our customers' traffic. You know? We're going to lose the ability to add convenience. Uh, so they, they think about things like, you know, we want to, you know, do deep packet inspection, do analytics so we can, you know, sell uh, advertising uh, or data to advertisers. Uh, you know, if you look at the thing, uh, if readers are familiar with what Verizon's doing in terms of adding a unique header to their customers, all of their customers, HTTP requests. Uh, you know, it's, it's really, uh, we're getting into an, an era where the ISPs themselves are, uh, to some extent, the, the ones most threatening internet users' privacy. Uh, and so I think we're going to have to sort of really uh, fight hard uh, to make sure that we can maintain our privacy uh, against the companies, the very companies that we need to connect us to the internet. Does the EFF get involved in any of the net neutrality debates? Oh, yes. Uh, so that's an interesting one. Uh, I'm uh, probably the technologist who's who at least in the past you know, six or you know, eight months has worked the most on net neutrality issues. Uh, and net neutrality is a tricky one because uh, it used to be, uh, you know, if you've been following EFF closely, up until June, we were very much of the opinion, hey, FCC, don't touch the Internet, don't regulate it, government, get the hell away. Uh, you know, we don't want you, you know, regulation is going to be the touch of death. You're going to, you know, hamper innovation. And that was, you know, and we really believe that. I mean, a big reason for that is, you know, if you look up the definition of regulatory capture uh, in the dictionary, it, it says CFCC. And, and, <laughs> and, then, and then you go to FCC and it says an agency where the people doing the regulating are former lobbyists and employees of the sort of companies that they're trying to regulate. Yeah. And future uh, lobbyists and employees. I mean, and you know, future lobbyists. I mean, it's just a revolving door. You get, you know, uh, I mean... The current FCC chairman, Tom Wheeler, is a former lobbyist for the, the cable companies and mm -hmm. for the mobile phone companies. Um, I saw that so in that's, the Colbert report, I think, did an, uh, a thing on net neutrality, was it? In, I know John uh, Oliver did. Yeah, uh, he did yeah, this huge one. thing about uh, cable company, uh, uh, a word, I'm, I don't know, what are we, PG-13? I'm probably not allowed to say that word. Fine. Yeah, you, yeah, I go for it, it's fine. <laughs> So he, I mean, he was talking. He was saying that you know, it's net uh, net neutrality has to do with preventing cable company fuckery of the internet, mm -hmm. uh, essentially. But That's, anyway, so getting that back language to it. was perfectly acceptable. Perfectly okay. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know for Cal. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, we were concerned. We didn't want you know the FCC to regulate the internet because we were afraid they were going to do things that were you know basically on behalf of the cable companies, on behalf of these sort of big corporations. But in about June, so after uh, you know, the Verizon uh, decision, which ruled that the FCC can't regulate, the, uh, can't enforce net neutrality unless it reclassifies cable companies, and after the FCC came out with some pretty bad net neutrality rules, we finally said, look, the only way we're going to be able to preserve an open and free internet, which the, the EFF does believe in. I mean, we've been a strong proponent of net neutrality, we just didn't think the right way to do it was through the FCC. 
Uh, but we realized that the FCC was going to try and regulate one way or another. So the only way we could keep the Internet free uh, and open was to try and force the FCC to do the right thing. And so since June, we've worked pretty hard to uh, get the FCC to do the right thing, which does mean Title II reclassification. But we want uh, the FCC to include a whole ton of forbearance, which basically means only take the tiny little bits of, the, of reclassification that you need to enforce net neutrality and then stay away from the rest of it. Don't, don't go into, you know, rate schedules and tariffs and, you know, all those sorts of crazy 1930s era laws because you don't need them. But there are parts of Title II that we do need to, you know, keep cable companies from basically fucking up our Internet connections. Mm. So that is the very long answer to, yes, we've done a little bit with net neutrality. Yeah, no. I, don't need, I don't need anybody else doing that. I do a good enough job of fucking up my internet connection all by yeah. myself. <laughs> all on my own. Um, I, I don't think you're the average consumer, though, Larry. I'm wow. Just, I'm just wow. saying. No, I'm above average consumer. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> there's, um, there's so much porn out there. I uh, consume a lot. <laughs> Richard and, and, and Jeremy, <laughs> what, what are some of the big wins for EFF uh, in your mind? I'll, I'll start with Richard so we kind of <coughs> want to balance, balance time equally between the, the two <laughs> of you. Me. It's funny because we just talked about net neutrality. So I want to make sure you each have equal bandwidth. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, so I guess uh, I could reach back pretty far into history and um, call out, I mean, something that is sort of uh, forgotten, but it's pretty fundamental is um, one of the early EFF cases was uh, Bernstein versus uh, U.S. Department of Justice. Um, this case is basically the landmark case that, that decided that uh, code is speech, that uh, computer code is, is uh, protected under the First Amendment. Um, that has had a, a host of implications, obviously, but um, I think that's one of the most fundamental ones that has meant that, um, that, that computer code is an expressive thing in, in, in sort of American legal tradition, you know, expressive uh, acts, they, they get a lot of protection. There's something that, you know, that the law wants to encourage and that, you know, we as a culture and society want to see. Um, so I think that that's, that's a big sort of foundational one. And, and a lot of other wins, I think, are sort of, are sort of keyed off of that. Um, Jeremy talked about a really recent one, um, you know, w which is the uh, Supreme Court decision saying that you cops need a warrant to search your cell phone. Um, that that technology, the cell phone technology obviously is, is massively prolific. And I think uh, one of the interesting trends there is that the user, I think, tends to have less control over their phone um, as, as an individual versus, you know, kind of our prior paradigms for this stuff where you have pretty much complete control over your computer if you, if you want it. You can, you can get it. It's pretty easy, and you should, you should do that. Um, but for mobile phones, it's less true. And in fact, I think from a security perspective, and I don't know if, if uh, you guys have have a debate on this or might have had past shows on this, but uh, that, that's an interesting trade-off, right? You know, an uninformed user, maybe they shouldn't have full root control over their phone for security reasons, but it also means that um, maybe they're, they're vulnerable to other kinds of things, or if um, that phone manufacturer makes a deal with, with the cops or makes a deal with some company to have some sort of tool that sucks all the data off the phone without having to unlock it or whatever, um, you know, that, the, that's a future that we could see. So, so the warrant standard, you know, come back with a warrant, that, that's a that is a, we have stickers with that, with that phrase, and it's something that we, we sort of really identify with and is really our line for, for when technology and law enforcement, you know, when there's a tension there, um, you know, it's come back with a warrant. That's a standard that we want, and that's the standard we're trying to establish. Um, you know, and another win, you know, I, I can't really categorize this as a win, but, but I have to say that, you know, the, the world's sort of like massively grown, growing awareness around, um, the vulnerabilities around digital technology, around the need to be a lot better about this kind of stuff. I mean, both on sort of just like a hygiene level, like just, you know, like choose a good password or use a password manager, like don't screw that up. Um, and, and, you know, the need, to, the need to sort of as a society uh, care a lot more about these things, elevate them um, in, in, in our thinking. Um, I think that that's sort of a growing bit of success um, and hopefully, you know, w the one thing that I think is really interesting is that uh, a lot of the surveys and research studies lately say that, like, the most average people don't believe they have any privacy on, on the Internet. They, like, they don't have any privacy using technology. That's a bummer, but, you know, they do believe that, uh, that they, can, they can get there. They just don't know how. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they do think that they want those protections, 
in law. They want those protections in the technologies themselves. They just don't know how. So this is a place where um, where EFF and technologists obviously can get involved, are involved, and have a lot of work in front of them. But um, it's there, there's a path to to, to winning this, and um, and that's something that I'm I, I'm kind of more excited about. I mean. If you would have told me in, uh, in 2008, 2009, when we were fighting telecom immunity in Congress, if you'd have told me there would, there would have been like marches in the streets around the Fourth Amendment, um, I probably would have like laughed at you. <laughs> and uh, even though I was involved directly in that work, and I mean, just, uh, just last year, we had exactly that, marches in the streets around the Fourth Amendment. So, um, so th that shift, that this transition is, is, um, is heartening, even as it comes amidst a time that's kind of... Uh, kind of has a lot of threats and it seems kind of dark. Now, Jeremy, go, go back to something Richard said about people using technology and wanting privacy and just not knowing how to get there. When your friends and family figure out what you do, do is their first question like, how do I protect my Facebook account? And like, what advice do you have for them? Right. Uh, I'm not sure they have figured out what I do yet. <laughs> well, that was, yeah, that was a hinging part of that question. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, to be honest, you know, and, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of other people who work in technology get this. I mean, they've been asking me that question long before yeah. uh, uh, I started at EFF. I mean, I'm sure we could all sort of uh, sympathize with the, you know, our parents coming to us and being like, wait, how does this Facebook thing work? Um, but, yeah, I mean, I do, that, I do get that question. And, and fortunately, you know, the answer is it's getting better. It's getting easier in terms of how to secure yourself. Uh, I mean, there are some huge steps you can take. You can uh, install things like HTTPS everywhere, our, our browser plugin, uh, which will force connections that aren't secure by default mm -hmm. uh, to, sec to be secure if the website supports them. Uh, and then there are better and better tools uh, for uh, having secure communications. Uh, EFF just released a secure messaging scorecard. Uh, which rated a lot of uh, messaging apps, uh, both for phones, uh, mobile phones, and computers, uh, about you know the the level of their security, and that was part of something we're doing uh, called the EFF uh, communicate uh, crypto usability prize. Uh, we're trying to make it much easier for normal people, you know, not security experts. Although maybe see, I don't know if security experts count as normal people or not. We'll uh, we'll let, we'll let everyone else decide that one. Uh, I'm a pretty normal guy. How about you guys? Right. Speak for yourself, Joff. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to make it easier for normal people to use, you know, strong crypto. Uh, and then there are other things. You know, we've got uh, a guide on our website, the Surveillance Self-Defense Guide, which has really easy tutorials on, you know, if I want to chat securely with somebody online, how, how do I get the app? How do I install it? How do I verify that it's, you know, that I, how do I exchange keys, et cetera? Uh, and so there's there are a lot of tools, and I think it's getting better. Uh, I, I really do. I like the column in your chart that uh, speaks for the security that asks, has there been any recent code audits? I mean, that's a big issue because, you know, part of it is as we learned when, uh, I mean, it's not directly code audits, but as we learned, you know, in, in some of the, the PRISM disclosures from Snowden, that some a lot of these companies can be, uh, you know, coerced or bribed or just convinced to work with uh, government agencies that will make the communications less secure. And the only way to combat that is to have uh, open security audits to guarantee that the, the code is doing what we expect it to do. Uh, and so that's a huge, huge requirement. And then again, you know, there are different levels of security audits. Uh, you know, uh, just having a, an audit is a start. Uh, and and we you know we'd, we'd like to move to a place where it's a routine and you have strong audits, uh, but even you know starting with something is it's the first step. And I mean it gets past the sort of uh, which I think is a little bit of an older notion that still has some important pieces in it, but that you know uh, uh, what is it bugs or as shallow as the number of eyes looking at them or whatever that like an open open source code is is the only way to go or is all you need to do and I don't think that's true. I mean with um, shell shock and. Uh, yeah, and Heartbleed and th these vulnerabilities. I mean, it's clear that, that some focused attention um, from some people with, with specialized expertise uh, is an important step. So um, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, that's why it's a column in the scorecard. It needs to be considered. So, so um, talk to us about how the EFF is funded and what people can do to help. Sure. Um, so EFF is, has sort of long uh, been a 
member-supported organization. So we try our best to solicit a lot of small donations from individuals, people who, uh, people who just like the work and want to support it. Um, we think that this is, uh, I mean, this is pretty important because we, we're always trying to work in the public interest. We're trying to work for users' rights. And that means that if you're accountable to regular individual people, um, it's, it, it's a good thing. It means that you're accountable to them if they don't like or don't understand what you're doing and you're not, or you're not doing a good job of explaining why it's important or what it is, then, then you'll lose that funding. So because we, we feel really strongly about um, working in the public interest and we think that we do that kind of work, we think that going out and, and raising funds from individuals is, is super important. So um, that's a big portion of our fundraising. Um, another uh, kind of like a funny angle to this is um, a lot of NGOs or nonprofits will be supported uh, by government funds and uh, we don't take money from the U.S. government if we can avoid it. Uh, well, not even if we can avoid it. I mean, we don't take money directly from the U.S. government, and um, we're pretty picky about the about that line. If, if there's another sort of agency somewhere that's working on like democracy or technology, you know, we'll scrutinize it really closely and make sure that any agreements that they give us um, are totally above board and protect protect us and protect the rights of the people that we work with and everything. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of interesting line, and I mean. Uh, that's pretty. The reason for that is pretty obvious because I think that maybe 75% of the cases in EFF's history, uh, it's something versus uh, United States, mm -hmm. uh, where we're we're up against the government all the time. So uh, so there's no reason to create um, an interest link there. Um, so, so we get I, a I'm lot sorry, of support from sorry, uh, so gamers. Oh, sorry. Go. Ahead. Yeah. So if you're an organization or an individual that would like help from the EFF, your chances are probably greater if you have some issue with the U.S. government, right? Um, <laughs> but, but then there's another classification as well. So like, how, how can people either get help themselves or just be aware so that us in the industry can recommend other people and say, hey, you may want to go seek the help of the EFF? Sure, yeah. Well, so we have an... In so I guess I'll describe a, a couple of things first. If what you're experiencing is like a constitutional issue, like um, it's an issue of free speech or... Um, or privacy, or, or and, and free speech and privacy have a lot of bounds, but a lot of times it's about your right as, as a technologist often to speak about things that you've discovered, um, to criticize companies um, in the world who are doing bad things or who are just failing uh, on their face. Um, those, are all, those are all sort of uh, bits and pieces of, of EFF's involvement, and um, we can chat, or you know, we, can, we can open up a line of communication and see, does this fit? Is this a case where... Uh, we can sort of advance rights as a part of it. Um, if it isn't, which happens fairly frequently, you know, it's, it's kind of rare to have a case that kind of fits the, all the makings of something that can be landmark and really, yeah. you know, really change the law and set different kinds of precedent. Um, we try to refer people to attorneys who are experts in, uh, in cyber law, as it were, uh, on their, in their own right, and so to get people help that way. Um, I guess a, another sort of... Uh, category of programs that a lot of uh, security people will, will experience is uh, if you're giving a talk at one of the uh, security conferences and EFF is there, um, you can try and set up time to, to chat about that talk beforehand um, and get a little bit of, um, of some, some tips and, and some, some observation to have a conversation about um, whether or not there are any risks there and you know, what you can do to sort of mitigate it. Um, again, especially if you're challenging a giant company. Um, with something that you you found um, a vulnerability or and, and you're going to talk about it, um, the the freedom to discuss those things is is uh, critically deeply First Amendment stuff, and that's those yeah. are the kind of things that we work on. Yep. But uh, to get back to process real quick, it's info at eff.org. Uh, that goes to our intake coordinator. Um, it's a job that's actually the first job I had at EFF was um, that sort of being on the front line, answering the phone, answering emails, uh, hearing from people who think they need legal help, and kind of um, working with them to to get that help. Yep. And, uh, you know, me very prescriptively uh, uh, as, I, gee, I can hear myself just fine. So. There you go. But uh, me very prescriptively dealing with uh, with the EFF uh, as part of my if it fits it ships, if it sniffs it fits type of presentation. Um, uh, one of my early project persons on that, uh, uh, Jay Radcliffe and I uh, actually sent some emails into info at, and uh, we worked with Nate and Kurt at the EFF and uh, they gave us some great advice about some of the things on our project that we can and can't do and some of the advice that we should consider and the, some of the things that we should you know stay out of to get our, keep ourselves out of hot water um, as doing part of our research so that that was you know that 
kept me out of an orange jumpsuit. So uh, yeah, and you know, I I, I want to add to that too. I really appreciate that anecdote. And um, you know, I will say here. So I'm not a lawyer, but I've seen the lawyers in operation, and these lawyers are fighty, and they're 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 <laughs> feisty. They, yeah, yeah. They really they want you to be safe, but they also don't they they don't want people to like censor themselves or not say something interesting. You know, they oh, yeah. they understand what's interesting about these about these issues, and they want to. They want it to go out into the world, and they want to sort of shield it from 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 legal attack, obviously, but even also from an attack that that would try and undercut its effectiveness. If that if, if I can explain that, so yep. um, so yeah, yeah. In in my experience, it was uh, their advice was quite honestly had nothing to do with the technology portion that we were trying to accomplish. In fact, from my reading between the lines, I thought it was very interesting and may have been in that involvement of this may be very um, uh, helpful to a lot of folks in that we can push this forward with some other legislation and, and changing of the way of, of thought and that type of stuff. But it was some other components of other laws that didn't really have anything to do with technology that were the problem. So... Um, essentially, it came down to shipping powered electronics through the through a postal service or or something of the like, and it uh, wasn't so much about what we were doing with those powered electronics. It was the fact that it was powered electronics. Interesting. Yeah. Um, did uh, the my illustrious host have any questions? Well, for well, I have one. Yes. Uh, and that and it goes along these lines. Maybe not very well formed, but I'll try. Um, my sense in today's world, especially of social media, is that generationally, um, those those younger than certainly I am, um, ha have a general erosion uh, precedent occurring in terms of privacy. Um, and it seems like the generation coming up with technology now doesn't seem to be very motivated in order to protect their privacy. Can you give us a sense of how the EFF feels about that, whether you're having an education problem uh, with the current generation of, of technology-aware uh, people that are you know, coming out of high schools and colleges today? Uh, I would actually push back on that, on that okay. assumption. Yep. Uh, a, a lot of the studies I've seen have, have said, actually, that younger people are more conscious uh, and concerned about their privacy but it's the particular things that they're willing to share and who they share them with uh, that just may be different than an older generation. And so it's not that they're, they're less concerned about their privacy, but it's that they're, they're actually more aware of the issue, uh, but that they, you know, they don't care if the, you know, the, the drunk picture of them you know, passed out shows up on Facebook, you know, uh, or they don't care if it shows up amongst their friends, they just don't want, you know, their prospective future employers to see it or something like so that. With respect yeah, and I, I think uh, they're actually more savvy about this or there's an increasing savviness to this that then is realized. And I mean, I guess another example as to, as to or, or an emblem of this is sort of the popularity of Snapchat. Yeah. Um, we can talk a lot about how Snapchat is not actually secure or how privacy <laughs> is not actually achievable on that platform. Um, but... Uh, the point is, at least they've sold this sort of this sort of image of like, oh, it's temporary and everything, and it the use of that exploded, especially amongst younger people. So, um, so yeah, I think this the the answer to this is 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 a little bit more complicated. I think the best research is by uh, Dana Boyd, a researcher who kind of works uh, pretty much exclusively or, or closely around around young people and what are what exactly are they doing? And I think the picture that it paints is is um, a little bit more complicated. Although there is a there are shifts. It's not that they care less about privacy, but but uh, Jeremy alluded to this. There, there are there are shifts in the norms, and there is maybe a a stronger propensity to share. Um, and I think that's one of the things that'll be interesting. Is I'm wondering if um, if this generation of people growing up, if they're going to still feel like they should um, trust uh, providers and platforms, or are they going to feel like they should have more control, and uh, how do I get more control? Well, that's by owning my, owning my machine, owning my own platform. Well, uh, you, you, you just put out the key word that that has bothered me in the industry for some time, and that is, as consumers and users on these various technology platforms, whatever they may be, whether they be social media, whether they be interactions with some sort of corporate entity, uh, what I think is missing is that people don't really have 
a personal ownership of that data. Um, and it's my hope that if, if the current generation coming up really do have that keenness and awareness of, of what they're putting out there, that then maybe that they'll actually push for that sense of ownership to be built in, to be facilitated by the technology going forward. I mean, I, yeah. I, de I, I definitely, uh, I share that same hope. Uh, I mean, we've, we've done some work on, uh, on big data issues, uh, so solely on the, the, the commercial side of big data, not about government. Uh, I mean, we've done government stuff too. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, that it's definitely something, you know, I mean, EFF strongly pushes for this idea of that the, the user should have control, and that includes of their own data. Uh, and so it's definitely something that's, that's concerned us and that we're, we're keeping an eye on as things go forward. Um, I think that yeah. maybe entrepreneurship is, is, is you know, hopefully going to be positioned to solve this kind of issue later somewhere down the road. And I guess what I mean by that is, like, um, you know, <clears throat> there was a lot of excitement around uh, uh, Diaspora, the um, distributed social network. Like, there was a lot of excitement around that. They just, you know, that there was there were some mismatches there. There wasn't a fit, and you know, the execution didn't play out. But that excitement means that there's an idea there that that someone may be able to capitalize on. Um, there are a lot of arguments to be made that maybe this, like, a, something like that, shouldn't be funded in the way that um, startups have been funded in the past because that creates a reliance on giant user bases and whatever and, and then eventually it's a slide to advertising and the sale of data so um, but you know there's some real cleverness that can happen you know both with the technology and with the business model and with but but all of it centered around that idea that people actually do want control of the data they just don't know how the models haven't been developed yet and that's something that we're always looking to see to see happen. Um, I, I have one of the early posts back when I was still an activist about being excited about distributed uh, social networking, um, and I think it's something that we could totally see. But it it, it needs to get there, and, and it's not really clear what the steps are from here to, to there. Um, but it's it's very pleasing to hear that that your supporters of of personal ownership of of data oh, and yeah. control, and um, because I I really would like to see our industry move in that direction strongly uh, and place some of this uh, uh, control of, of personal data right back in the hands of those who, who should have that control. Uh, and the models, like you said, they're just not there yet. Um, so, okay, very good, very good. Uh, Next. Jeremy and Richard, I have five very important questions for the each of you, uh, for each of you. So are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Sure. Uh, sure, sure, okay. sir. Uh, let's That's see, you uh, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you are sitting down, right? Uh, Jeremy, <laughs> I will start with you. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, dedicated, uh, passionate, and nerdy. <clears throat> Richard? Um, sleepy, <laughs> uh, not drunk. Or sleepy and not drunk, yeah. There <laughs> so you I'll go. go through. Those are three words. <laughs> Richard, or not drunk yet. How about that? There, there you go. go. <laughs> not drunk yet. I like that. Richard, <laughs> if you were a serial killer, <clears throat> what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, so I, I cheated a little bit. I, I heard some of the five questions, and uh, I don't know if I have a good answer to this, but uh, just for the for the for the punniness of it, I would. Uh, it would be Lucky Charms. I would. I would. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say cereal. Yes. Lucky I, Charms. I, I, oh, I mean, that it could be another, another cereal as well. I was thinking uh, grape nuts is good for this. It's a very dense, dense, dense uh, cereal. cereal. Uh, it's gross, also. So you know. But um, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, see me. A I, torture I, me on me on that route. I'd go for Captain Crunch because when you've got the munchies and you do Captain Crunch, you, you turns you the roof of your mouth into like raw gobbets of raw <laughs> mouth flesh. Yeah. It's not nice. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, Jeremy, we, if you were a serial ahead. killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Oh, so this is easy. So I actually, before working at EFF, I uh, actually got a PhD in robotics, working on uh, oh, aerial oh, oh, oh. robotics, uh, so drones, basically. So I would definitely use a, a drone. Best answer I think I've heard all year. Jeremy, mm -hmm. if you were to write a book about yourself, what would the title be? Oh man! Uh, I mean, I've got yeah, the boring title, answer, which is which is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, yeah, we'll take it. it. Oh man! I'll, 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 I'll take it. Yes. Oh. Richard. Um. Uh. 
That is not a good title. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> yeah, try again. Yeah, right. Those, yeah, those, that's those, not one, I think. Those would not be good titles. Um, the Man, the Myth, the Misery. That would be that would be my title. Richard, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Okay, so uh, can I be naive here and, and get and ask for an explanation? I hate to I hate to be that guy. It's but, like the uh, spelling bee. No. It's definition. <laughs> no, no explanation. All, you just got to go with it. All I'm, right, I just, Richard, just all, go with it. Okay. all I'm allowed to say is that it's popular in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's all I'm allowed to say. Um, all right, then uh, as, a, as an avid game player, I will go for the first player advantage, and I would go first. Wow, that's two Jeremy? in one show. Two in yeah, one show. I'm, I'm going to, since I'm in the same boat as Richard, I have no idea what the heck this is. Uh, I'm going to go second so I can watch the first person and, and figure out how the game works. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Very nice, nice move. Nice move. Uh, Jeremy, choose two celebrities to be your parents. Oh, man. Uh, do they have to be living celebrities? No. No. We'll try to make oh. this as easy as possible because it is a difficult question, and now I am stalling so that you both have more time. Oh, I no, <laughs> this is easy. Ada oh, okay. Lovelace and Thomas Jefferson. Very nice. Wow. Very nice. Wow, okay. that's, that's a good answer. I'll wow. take that one. That's, that's a, like that's highbrow and everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> throw, throw, that, throw down the gauntlet. You know? Maybe we should that just turn the, over the show to him. That brought the <laughs> class <laughs> level right up, um, almost out of the gutter. I got a <laughs> drink with my pinky up. Yeah. <laughs> good luck, good luck, That's not oh, a no, pinky. No. Uh, so I thought about this a little bit. Uh, so Angelina Jolie, but Hackers era, Angelina Jolie, uh, and Keanu Reeves. Wow. So, we oh, are, we are now like three, three for three. Three for three. On Angelina. Done Angelina Jolie. On this show alone. Has been the most. Wow. All right. Yeah. Been the most. Plus, a, a very popular celebrity, right. but the hackers era only. I mean, has to be the know, hackers. Right. Must yeah. be a significant hotness factor going so, on there. Yeah. So, so in other words, with breasts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> oh, what? Too soon? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we've Jeremy, we've gone so far that I just want to say um, it's strange being on a panel with two people from the EFF when we're not judging people's facial hair at DevCon. Because that's normally when I'm on a yeah, panel I with EFF. And, with, and you know what? I'm also surprised and Aaron, uh, that, that we allowed John to be on this segment. And John Strand is here on the segment. Uh, we, Jeremy and Richard, we had this very funny segment we did at ShmooCon one year where John was a little intoxicated. A little? Okay, so he was really drunk. <laughs> Wasted Strand. And Wasted Strand came out and was yelling at people in the audience and somehow figured out that uh, a lovely young lady worked for the EFF and John so lovingly called out and said, hey you, EFF girl, get over here, I want to talk to you. And it was just whatever, it lived in infamy in the archives. Hopefully uh, we can remove it. Or I got better. Know. Yeah, so John's here for his public apology to the EFF. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, sorry EFF. There you go, there you go. <laughs> Thank you John, we appreciate it. Uh, Not a problem. Jeremy and Richard, thank you very much for coming on the show. I want to remind everyone to go donate to the EFF. Um, is there an easier donate link, Jeremy and or Richard? Uh, EFF.org slash donate. There you go. EFF.org slash donate. Please go donate now. Thank you guys again for appearing on the show. And thanks for all of your hard work. Cool. Thanks for having us. Thank a you. Pleasure. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back with a fabulous panel discussion. Titled, this is, I, I'm really proud of this title. I came up with this title in one of the meetings. One vulnerability to rule them all until the next one. With H.D. Moore, Dave Kennedy, and Rob Mubix that, Fuller. That's fantastic. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.